Yeah, I'll kick this off by talking about the goals of YG Page Support in Guest MemFD. Um, so the first goal is to provide physically contiguous 1G pages. And mapping these pages is out of scope because we expect private pages to be managed by KVM and the shared pages will be managed by Core MM. The second goal that we have is to avoid double allocation when backing shared and private memory. And Vishal will be elaborating on the double allocation problem later on. Um, so at this point, I'll stop here and see if anyone has any questions that we can clarify about the goals. Yeah, okay. Um, I, in that case, I'll jump into the options for 1G pages that we have. Uh, the first option is huge CLB. This is the option that we picked for our RFC implementation. Um, to use HTLB, we had to refactor HTLB to extract the allocator component. So this refactoring is expected to have no functionality change. And we, we expect to just improve the modularity of HTLB. And we think that this is a useful step if HTLB is to be integrated into Core MM. The first pro that we see of using HTLB is that it allows us a graceful transition from HTLB to guest MFD. Um, by graceful transition, we mean that today's VMs can use HTLB memory to back its VM memory. And before guest MFD, while guest MFD is maturing, um, these VMs will still be using HTLB today. And we want these VMs to be able to be scheduled on the same host as the confidential VMs that use guest MFD. The main point of having them uh, be schedulable on the same host is that both of these VMs will be drawing 1G pages from the same HTLB pool. And this means that we don't have to give up memory savings that the VMAP -map optimization offers us. The second pro is that using HTLB allows us a way to have iterative steps toward a new future allocator. So we can have HTLB as a beginning and we can slowly swap out parts or morph those parts into a new future allocator. So this way we don't have to dive fresh into a new allocator straight up. So the obvious con here is that we will have to take a dependency on HTLB and this dependency may end up not being temporary if we cannot manage the user space visible changes. So one example of this is that the, there's this huge, free huge pages statistic that HTLB has. And this number is going to go up or down when guest MFD gets its pages via the huge TLB pool. So if we don't have a nice way of implementing this, then we may have to keep the dependency around. And the next option, the next option that we have is the contiguous memory allocator or CMA. So to use CMA, we will have to port some huge TLB features to be applied on CMA. And the first of which is 1G page pools or some sort of page pools so that we can retain the, the allocation guarantees that huge TLB gives us today. The second feature that we need to port over is VMAP -map optimization or some kind of similar optimization so that we can save on the memory um, that's used by page structs the entail pages. Yeah, so these are what just some of the bigger features. And of course, we will have to port over some kind of charging mechanism and reporting mechanism as well. The pro of using CMA is that it gives guest MFD a clean slate. So we don't have to inherit huge TLB's features. Um, but the con is that we will be rebuilding or duplicating some of the huge TLB features. Couple questions. So the, in, for, yeah. For the inheriting the huge TLB features, is that inheriting the ugliness of huge TLB that people dislike? Or is it just inheriting the physical memory allocator parts of huge TLB, which I assume is not We expect that the, the refactoring that we talked about earlier 
it just takes out the allocator features. And the part that most people don't like is probably the user space facing features. Like the specialized the special casing within Core MM of the double the shared PMD mappings and the special page for the huge TLB fault handler that, that huge TLB has. Like those stuff will not be inherited. Right. So I think what you're saying is you're, you're only using UHTLB to obtain one gigabyte pages. And I mean, there is the UHTLB V memmap optimization, which c could be abstracted away and reused in other contexts. Um, I would prefer if we could avoid stealing pages from UHTLB and instead abstract the memory pool in a way that you could move pages into guest memfd or into UHTLB. It, it might require a little bit more work, but there would like there would be like a clean separation of this is like the UHTLB stuff and this is the guest MFD stuff. But for some use cases that bigger companies might have to have, there are still ways to move a page, transition it from guest MFD into UHTLB to use for a database or something like that. So, yeah, that's that's a good that's a good point. The the thing the important fo point to focus here is that. 1G pages are hard to get, right? So you have to carve them out at the boot. So as long as, um, so there, has, there is one global pool that you will carve out, and if you want to have two users of 1G pages, they either have to get it via same global pool, or they have to have separate pools that are dynamically resizable without losing HVO, for example, because HVO brings in very important savings, memory savings. So as long as we have that, that should work. Um. This really sounds like it's the wrong track to ask this question. There's definitely another track tomorrow where I think this is probably better answered. But I can't imagine wanting to do a whole other allocator here. I mean, refactoring and stuff sounds great, but like for now, it should be seems like the way to go. I mean, I, the clean slate means we don't have to deal with other people. Is kind of <laughs> what you're saying, which is fun, but I, I don't think we're in a position. So if we do go UTLB, a question that's not on the slides, but in the RFC, do we actually need a super block, or at least a, uh, the, the, the whole magic thing, do we actually have to have a file system that's exposed to user space, or can this all be just through the KVM IOC? Sorry, I, I um, at this Oh, I see. Go on, Natalie. You go. Oh, yeah. As as it is implemented right now, um, the file system doesn't doesn't need to be a directly accessible by user space, but it does need the the internal mount. Yeah, I mean, I think the allocation. Like we need a space. Really the allocation happened really early, and I, I assume that's the portion of this that you need is the stuff that goes and allocates it, carves it out of the you know the regular allocator pool, and then keeps the list of them. That's that's the part you need, right? And that's before. I, I think Superbox not even around then, is it? Oh, okay. Uh, also, you mean you mean maintaining the pool within I guess MMFD? I think so. Um, for that, we don't actually. In the RFC, there was I can get the patch, but it adds the guest oh, the the DMEM magic number back and has that you know pseudo super DB. Do we actually? Is there a reason for that? Like functionally, do we need? We are using it right now to clean up the inode. So some of the huge TLB metadata needs to be stored on the inode. And we store it on the inode because it is a property of the of the memory. So the inode is the right place to store that but with the that metadata. MFD, don't we have the way we implemented it, we have a inode per guest MFD instance in the RFC. Yes. But using the anonymous inode doesn't give us a the callback to clean up the inode where the inode is released. So can we solve that instead of having the <laughs> having the full file system? I think it should be solvable. Yeah. Okay. Actually, do you have anything more? Um, I'm I'm taking notes. I'm not sure if it's solvable, but we can look at it. Okay. Yeah, we will we'll get more. We'll take out more information on RFC. Okay. 
things. So, um, okay. Yeah, one, just wanted to call out here that um, in one of the internal discussions, uh, one of our co-workers, Frank, have suggested that we can build on CMA by having CMA manage, by extending CMA to manage pools of VM PFN memory. And that this VM PFN memory is a, uh, is memory that is not managed by the virtual memory file system. So Frank also suggests that we can allow M mapping of this memory to user space via device nodes. Yeah, and Frank will be posting an RFC on this shortly. I don't still quite understand what the problem is because I mean, all you want is like, in an ideal world, you carve out some memory during boot, which should still be thus, which can be implemented very efficiently in a similar way by, I don't know, factoring it out. And maybe you also want the option to use CMA, which should still be also thus, which can be factored out during reuse. So w what speaks against just having like a global pool of gigantic, gigantic pages, which other THP users in the future might want to use, have the option of huge to be to consume these pages from the global pool or just consume them from guest MFD. What, what, what's the basic challenge that we try to abuse huge to be here and steal pages and convert back and forth and use, I don't know, some file system magic. It's just a pool of like large chunks that get allocated during boot or using CMA and that's it. What, what's the biggest issue here? CMA doesn't track memory at one G granularity. So you lose HPO right away if you give it back to CMA. Um, yeah, and there, there are more possible use cases of this pool, right? We, we have a similar use case for live updates where we want to put all this memory, we call it guest memfs in a file system and pass that across from old kernel to new kernel. And if this persistent in-memory file system could also draw from this sort of pool of one gig pages, that would be a really useful abstraction. That, that's the point I'm trying to make. We don't want everybody to base their stuff on huge DLB. Okay. At least I don't want it. <laughs> I hear that. So effectively, we see guest MMD going its own way and be the be the thing for backing guest memory, irrespective of what granularity it is. Exactly, and that's why the huge DLBFS option is created as a transitionary option, which we will go up in the short term and the next in the long term you would have much cleaner from the scratch hopefully um, and and ho hopefully we will build on build build it using Frank's work which should be get should get posted soon so what I hear is in short term we should be okay with refactoring which will be out uh, refactoring some functionality or some things will be out and in the long term yes we want to go to a cl more cleaner path which yeah which hopefully will come soon so um, moving on to the next topic that we now now we have one G pages and I will take that over. We have one G pages. Uh, sorry, before I take over, Akil, did you have anything else? Not good. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Akil. So now we have one G pages. Now, as you, I mean, yeah, we move to the part where move to the part where yeah, you have one G pages. Now, if you want to use one G pages to back confidential VMs. Um, there are issues. Uh, the issue is that today's guest memory supports only backing private memory and needs separate store for backing shared memory. And guests can convert at any granularity they want, starting from 4K. So during conversion, if user space VMM needs to unback private, so to ensure that you don't allocate memory on both the stores, you need to unback one and back the other during conversion, right? So if private memory is backed by 1G pages, you cannot unback the sub pages of 1G page um, for valid reasons, it's a 1G page, right? So that's, because of that, you land into a double allocation issue and basically memory gets full, right? So if there are some images that effectively showcase this. So the solution for this problem, um, Th this was discussed in, I mean, solution in the sense, the direction that we want to head in is was discussed in MM alignment call. Uh, thanks to Bobo and Andrew for driving this discussion. Um, so basically, yeah, I mean, one thing is you avoid having two stores. Just have one store and allow a map. 
fault in shared ranges, supporting only shared ranges. So we built basically on top of quad and, and the SVO, right? Um, now, the invariance, you want to ensure that only private ranges are faultable by USP, uh, sorry, only shared ranges are faultable by USP, not private, uh, pri not private ranges. So to ensure that, you have to split one two pages on the go, and so that only shared memory ranges can be faultable. And you reconstruct them back when it is safe for the heap space to be bold again. So now this was the RFP RFP thing that we did, right? That was posted up screen, uh, posted on uh, on the mailing list. So we encountered a few issues with this approach, right? The first of the bat is, yeah, I mean, you ha you split the pages on runtime, and then you want to clean up the file. How do you reconstruct the page back and give it back to the allocator the way you got it? So in yet, OS series introduces the concept of safe rest count, which is essentially tries to wait for a rest count with all the other acti activity just to go down so that it can be safely split from share to private. Now, in this scenario, you will not, there is no way for splitting here. Like, there's no way to continuously go to a place where you can reconstruct the heap back. So, one option here is you need a callback on the folio when actually all the users drop. So that all the active users are dropped, you can reconstruct the page back. How are we cleaning up the inode if there are still users? It's, it will, the inode can be cleaned up because it will not have a claim on that memory. Which is bad news. Uh, meaning, so inode will drop, uh, for example, just the way SHMEM would do. It will just truncate the memory from file map. So inode is not associated with that memory, but the memory needs to be reconstructed back somewhere, somehow. So does that make sense? I didn't follow that. <laughs> okay. Maybe it was a clean or not to- Maybe another way to say- Sorry, maybe another way to say it is that we can clean up and the inode ahead of the folio cleanup. So all the information required for the folio to be reconstructed and returned to HTLB is is like stored somewhere in the folio and then we rely on this callback to do the, the reconstruction. I wonder if, if we really need this exercise in reconstruction, reconstruction. Maybe it will be cleaner for if uh, guest memory provides one gigabyte page, never convert it in place but provide other MFD or whatever for shared pages only. So that's the problem we want to solve, which is landing us in double allocation. It's a significant amount of memory, right? But if you allocate one gigabyte pages, you don't care about memory footprints that much. You do, Clou <laughs> as a cloud service provider, you do a lot. So the way you're talking about the inode, you make it sound like you have an inversion of the way a file system with inode usually works. Because if you have use of a memory range, usually that has a reference count on the inode, which means that the last thing to go to zero is usually the inode's reference, not the memory count. If you do it the other way around, it will be a very surprising thing to be doing in the kernel. It's probably going to lead people into making mistakes with it. Okay, you want this back to it? David has a I completely agree. I'm wondering because all you, you're really changing is the tail pages, that like the tail pages, they don't know distinct pages. Maybe there are ways that you only special case them and like the first head page or however that before you split it can contain all of the information. M maybe there would be ways that, because like the, the, the head page ref count you can freeze and everything is fine and only for the tail pages that you can special case them in the guest memory C part. I'm not completely sure how that would work, but at least like there might be ways forward with, with that. So basically, yeah. So we need to reconstruct the page. I mean, we probably will not clean up the inode, keep it around to ensure that it fits to the current semantics. But we, we still need a way to reconstruct it back one act certain active users are gone. So we The only time you should have to really care about reconstituting a one gig page is if you are mapping it back into the guest or private. And that gives you a synchronous, synchronous boundary because user space is going to make a 
these syscalls that tell KVM to map the one gig back into the guest. And at that point, if you've given the ref count to whatever it needs to be at, you're good to go and you reconstitute. And the other case would be when you're freeing the memory back to the general pool, which again, you would have to wait for the ref count to go to zero or whatever it goes to. So not understanding why we have this inversion of the inode possibly being released before the ref count is done. So, okay, so the way I should have said probably is we want specifically focus on the case where we want to free back the memory, right? When guest memory file needs to be cleaned up, right? It, the memory is still held, I mean, memory is still split. I mean, the pages are still split. It needs to be reconstructed back. So to be able to reconstruct it back, we need to ensure that all the active users are gone so that you get a full callback. And, and Core MM involves implement a special callback for such pages so that we could reconstruct it pa page back and give it back to the locator. Now the way it would, I mean, the point here is, your point is effectively, can I know drop its ref count is, is the point. Or how, how can the inode ref count go to zero if you have active users of it? That's the part I don't understand. Inode ref count, basically the point I was trying, I mean, we were trying to, my thinking was effectively you will remove it from file map. The inode ref counts are basically the allocation and the file map for that page, right? And if you drop that, and when the active users will go down, it will go down to zero eventually. When I say active users, they are, those are outside guest memory. Because you allow MMAP, so as soon as you allow MMAP, yeah, I mean, anybody can hold and pin the pages. Well, if I assume there's machinery there, though, that so the. Yeah, yeah. Like Sorry? Like you grab a reference to the file because you're mmapping a file, and then until that. Yeah. What am I missing? <laughs> because the inode shouldn't go to zero until all mmaps -map have gone, right? Mm -hmm. Because they should hold a reference to the inode. So, what happens when you unmap the pages and it's pinned to your file? I mean, it's pinned by your file. Well, but surely there's a file descriptor reference somewhere that's also holding your inode, right? Yes. So the it's still, you see the pinning in the inode reference, right? So the, the inode is the thing that's, if you're, if you're trying to be like a file system, the inode thing is the thing you're supposed to be holding at the top that's the master reference for everything you've got in this one gig page. Any, anything that takes references to subchunks of that page should also in increment that inode reference. Your life cycle should be, if I suddenly want to get this page yeah, back. Yeah, but it doesn't go to zero until the file system is done. It doesn't. Yeah, so then, so then how do file systems work with huge pages? That's the point. We need to make it so that it's not like a file system. So what you're telling me is we have this huge bug in Linux that you're just trying to take. Well, there's no bug in Linux. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, the life cycle should be that you delete the inode which means that nobody else is allowed to take an MMAP of it. That's how the reference count goes to zero. If that works, then I would have been having this. I mean, yeah, if that that's the way it should work, then great. If it doesn't, then I, I, I feel that get user pages doesn't take care, doesn't worry about what I know. I could have sworn that, that there is something where you're not able to truncate if there are Expected references somewhere. Well, what do I mean? Yeah, but I, I thought that like during truncate there is somewhere a check that checks for unexpected references, and a pin is just an unexpected reference. And I think that there would be m some magic in there, but I, I would but have to truncate. dig in. I would have to dig into the code. Okay. And is, are there issues beyond truncate? Because if it's just truncate, we can add that to guest mem if need be like no. This. But no, truncate is, Trunk there are two truncates. File close, I mean, you want to, when you close the file and you want to see the file resources. That have, that it's like, yeah, it's not truncated. Okay, it's so it's by the specifically because it sounds like the one gig 
PGRE stuff doesn't actually bump inode reference when you have long-term pins. So it would be in guess one of these four. Now, how to handle that? If that's the way it should be done, then great. If it's not done, then we'll have to think about four, four and one. Probably an MM stuff. So why can't we solve this outside of this? Yeah. Like, you know, why is it being done by the same guy that's doing the PGRE stuff? We'll spend this discussion. I guess the young car works a lot on, on solving that. And I don't think we, we have like an solution for this. Like we, we try to distinguish long-term pins from short uh, term pin, pin on the pages. Like we have pin user pages and uh, gap user pages, which have has to have different semantics. So we expect if you get user pages, you expect it to free it soon. What means soon is also not really clearly defined in code. So, okay, just to short on this, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll go check this, but if, if it can be solved in guess only great. If it cannot be, then we'll need some core MM help to feed those folios, especially. Uh, I, I, I mean that the, the basic problem you're trying to solve is that, like, you might have a ref count of one on, I don't know, uh, 512 times 512 pages, and you want to freeze all of the ref counts so you can actually convert it, to you reconstruct it to a one gigabyte folio, and you need a notification once all of that happened because you don't want to be busy scanning 512 to the power of two ref counts all of the time. So the question is, is, is there could be other, another way that you could more easily detect that this is not possible? I mean, I mean, you talk about a, like if a ref count goes to zero, maybe something else goes to one. It's a bad idea, but I mean, may, maybe there would be different ways to optimize that. Um, but the, the, I think like the, the, co the core issue is like, we could get one gig support into Gaston MFD, we would just lose the VMAP optimization. You care about the VMAP optimization yes. at this point. Yes, yes. We so very much care about okay. achieving that at all. So I, I would like to cover next few points. Oh yeah, sorry. Elliot? I, I, I was gonna ask if you could use CMA because then you don't have to uh, reconstruct a huge page, a huge TLB page. But if you care about the VMM map, then yeah, I, I guess that's not really a solution, so. So, thanks, Eliot, yeah. Uh, I would like to quickly cover the next slide, uh, and and I, I guess we'll have some next steps on this one. Um, so, so now when you want to split and merge, you're trying to do it with private deep space, right? Um, so then you have to deal with extra ref counts on private memory as well, mainly on private memory. So effectively, extra ref counts can be taken, grabbed by KVM slash R subsystem, right? So you, to solve that, I mean, if, if you want to solve it, you want to ensure that there are no temporary ref counts outside and that could can race with to split or merge. One policy, policy that can be implemented here is guess MLD owns all the long-term ref counts of private memory. Any short-term ref counts distributed outside guess MLD should be protected by folio lock. Um, and that means guess memory pins memory for all the all the private memory users. So if guess memory truncates anything, all the users are notified, including IMU, which Jason touched base on. So we would be looking forward to IOMMU callback notifier so that guess when we can clean up IOMMU entries, also KVM EPD entries on truncation. Okay. Uh, we're out of time, but real quickly, can you give an example of when KVM would grab a ref count long term? Just so we have that on record and we know what we're trying to solve. The, there is no current long term ref count in KVM. So this is mostly a theoretical problem? Yes. So for example, TDX patches in the early versions try to take the ref count, long term ref count, by because they wanted to ensure that page doesn't get migrated, but that doesn't need to happen now. So Okay. So can we just say don't do that? Yes, exactly. That's what I want. Uh, one example of such a long term ref count would be the KVM clock page, for example. 
KVM clock. So this is private memory. Sorry, I think I missed this part. So this is right, but essentially um, the the guest which the, because KVM clock page needs to be shared between host and guest because they use it to communicate. So this this is just for private memory. I mean, so when I say private memory, it's the radio track is just private memory. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. So, so basically, s I, I didn't explain a bit about split and read scenario, but but if you want to, so the scenario for split is you split a pri take a pri private page, split it into chunks, and for sh merge, it is you take a completely private page, marked as private, and then it reconstructs. So it's mostly pri private memory that I'm worried about in this case, in this context. Uh, I just want to raise that uh, I think when we discussed the whole thing with Jason Gunthorpe, he said something like, we might just be able to optimize the VMAP app for private pages differently, meaning that you don't do the reconstruction and anything. Like as soon as you get it, you, you split it once, and then you optimize the VMAP app yourself because the ref counts of all of the pages, they should be one, and maybe you can redirect them just to the head page or something like that, and then like you wouldn't have to do the stance between splitting and reconstructing. You would just not try to avoid the huge TLB VMAP -MM optimization. You would do it on your own with the private memory. That's a great direction. That would be great. The only concern would be the races between the temporary ref counts and yeah. you want to truncate TFMs. So uh, that would be interesting to know how it would be handled. But that would be a long-term story, I yeah. feel. So for now, we have to stick to this, I feel. We'll, we'll see what, what, what ends up in a clean way on the stream, yeah. But I mean, the VMAP -MM optimization, you're, you're in inheriting that from huge TLB, and we, we saw that it creates quite some issues, so maybe we want to handle that on our own. Makes sense. Okay, so thanks, thanks, folks. Great, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, yeah, thanks for coming to um, another guest memory session here at the KVM Microconference. Uh, my name is Patrick Roy. I'm from AWS. I work at um, Firecracker, which is a KVM based virtual machine monitor running things like um, AWS Lambda. Um, my topic today is um, I'm mapping guest memory from the host kernel to direct map. And um, first, I should establish why would we want to do such a thing. Um, for us, unmapping guest memory from the host kernel to direct map is a defense in depth measure against various spectral like vector based execution attacks um, started inside the guest. Um, and we want, to, we want to protect guest memory from these attacks. And obviously, there's multiple parts of it. Um, guest memory, which is going to be the, the topic of, of this session, um, is one of them. Another is, for example, um, things like vCPU state, um, where a colleague, colleague of mine um, has also posted a patch series that I've linked there um, that takes the sort of like um, memory seeker style approach to protecting things like the KVM run structure. Um, but like I said, I want to talk about the um, guest memory here today. Um, how do we want to do this? Um, we've had some discussion in the mailing list. We want to extend um, guest memory for you with this um, functionality. Um, <coughs> and there's the point where I'm going to tell you that this talk is also pivoted a bit. Um, because it turns out um, actually just removing the direct map entries for guest memory is fairly straightforward because guest memory is its own separate thing. Only KVM knows about it. We know what KVM does with it. Uh, KVM actually doesn't try to read or write it. Um, so if the direct map entries are there or not, it's fairly straightforward. We can just remove them. Um, what actually is a bit more complicated is what we would then want to do with this sort of modified guest memory after that. Um, it has to run a guest inside of it. And um, we would like to, to, to not change the way in which we do this very much. Um, so we want to be able to treat our guests the same way that we're able to 
actually guessed in traditional, um, in, a, in a traditional VM with traditional mem slots. Um, and so particularly, for example, uh, in a traditional VM, there's a bunch of space places inside of KVM where KVM just accesses the guest memory to, to do something. For example, MMO emulation on x86, um, KVM clock I mentioned it earlier because it's SEA, so MMO clock is the same problem. Um, and so actually allowing this while using guest memory key is itself a lot more um, complicated. Yep. If we allow, if we allow MMAP, how much of this is still a problem? Um, well, if we allow MMAP, then um, I was going to actually get to that. Then the um, useless virtual addresses are not going to be reflected back into the KVM mem slots, right? So for KVM internal accesses, we still need some sort of solution. Why not? I mean, I always thought that that would just be not acceptable, but if you're telling me that that would be okay. That's preferable to having to change how KVM accesses guest memory. It, and and you're going, if you're going to map shared memory, if you're, if you're mapping, if you're doing in-place conversion mm -hmm. and you're m-mapping into user space and you also want to share that memory with the guest, a simple way to do that is to allow a mem slot with the host virtual address that points at guest memfd and KVM just simply doesn't care. Um, right, so um, you're, you're right, we, w we wanted to adopt this, um, this, this model of um, in-place conversion, shared private version versus guest memfd that was introduced earlier in the PKVM talk. Um, the difference between what we want to do, what PKVM wants to do, in PKVM's case, these conversions are driven by the guest, so the guest just makes a hyper call and then um, it gets changed to, to shared. Whereas in our case, um, not the guest is owning these conversations, but the host is owning these conversations conversions, sorry. Well, no, I mean, even in the PKVM and the other confidence compute use cases, the host owns the conversions. The guest makes requests and the host can tell them no. Practically speaking, that doesn't happen because the host wants to keep the guest running, but it's still a host controlled conversion. I don't see how this is fundamentally different. You still have the host that says you can access this in place and you can access it in shared. Yes, but which part of the software running on the host side? In the PKVM model, it's PKVM. It's not Linux and KVM running in EL1. It is the, the low bike. So it's ultimately controlled by the guest. The guest decides whether a given page is shared or private, and that's enforced by the code running in EL2. It's not up to KVM per se. Very confused though. This is not a confidential compute use case, correct? No, it's not. So why do we not just say user space, you can map whatever you want? We would be fine with that, but when we posted that on the mailing list, we got told no. <laughs> that, that, is, that is, I think, a viable solution to this, but that is that the best from a security perspective to basically say user space needs to map the whole of the address space, or can we get a better security posture where we say we actually don't even map the guest's memory in, in address space and we get an improved security posture. I think practically speaking though, if you want to improve the security posture, you really want the guest to be in on it to say, I'm explicitly sharing this with you. Practically speaking, because if you're just doing it behind the hood, then you're yeah. We live in a world where we even had to MMA then under KVM <laughs> because guests don't change. We want to give guests the most secure environment they can have. And that means protecting them from all kinds of vector et cetera attacks by taking stuff out of the memory map when we don't need it. Which is fine, but should you at least have the host user space be in on it so that you can audit that yes, KVM has indeed allowed this to be mapped through KVM clock, through nested page tables if you're doing shadowing, yada, yada, yada. And like, I don't think you have to have a back door into guest map to get what you want because then you also have another channel to get into memory. So yes, you don't have to map all of guest memory and you do have these points where you can explicitly say, hey, your guest wants to access this user space. Do you want to map this into the guest or not? And then you don't have to go change any of the get user, put user stuff in KVM because it just goes through the normal new access that Another restriction that here, I don't know, If your VM and QMU rules can actually access the guest, it's going to do things such as IOs, and those IOs are going to be effectively passing 
trade just back to the kernel you nag or you try quote unquote what you extract trade under the hood uh, and rely on your you know matching game presence so uh, because you can just use a driver who's going to do things that may or may not be VMA uh, etc etc so you you have a whole bunch of corner cases uh, that are going to happen the minute your VMM is going to start using that mapping and pass those addresses to some form of IO uh, in your system. Uh, you can't guarantee it's all VMA, you can't guarantee, uh, I don't know, some network drivers might just copy things sometimes, or there is a tail of something, or, uh, or you end up with a ID device. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the, the, the difficulty of having is if it's mapped in QMU, and QMU is told to your VMM, and the VMM thinks it can do normal operation and IOs and neither can God knows what things on it. And it's not mapped and the struct pages under the hood are not mapped to the kernel. You're gonna have a lot of interesting corner cases to deal with. But again, can't we just ensure that we map it but it gets replaced into the address map? How much are you here? Any, any more, but the kernel at least used to have a mechanism to deal with the struct space problem for your system, quote unquote, not being mapped. It's called KMAP, and it's the same with Hyman. So if that infrastructure still exists, which honestly I don't think much more anymore, uh, maybe we could play around by repurposing it for that type of stuff by which we don't necessarily map user space memory generally, not just for VMs, uh, in the linear mapping uh, and rely on the existing KMAP infrastructure via some page flag of some sort uh, to, to do on-demand mapping if the page has been used for some dodgy IO or God knows what. Just being crazy here. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that would bring back like HTML to the 90s style of language if you propose that. Like. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Sorry, just to correct my understanding, isn't what Ben described where there's user space mapping but the pages aren't mapped in linear, linear map, isn't that an MMT secret then? Doesn't that do exactly that? Yeah, but again, it's not secret. You can't do IO mapping. True, but I think you're saying you didn't want to do IO to yeah, work. Yeah, I'm not sure. hybrid uh, so like in the sense of if it's m map and it's not in the direct map you can't do io can we do something along those lines how does something like that must already be there from mft secret yeah yeah <laughs> well <laughs> here no this is closer so so you're talking about unmapping the get um, MV here, right? Like taking it off the fizz map. What about other, you, you mentioned vCPU state. That's another place where you could, you can info leak stuff out, right? There are other places in the kernel where you end up with uh, sensitive data from the guests you can leak from a vector like the cache. So do you need more granularity than just removing fizz map, uh, guest memory from fizz map? And then what's the plan there? Because uh, you, you get rid of this one. You mean like, what's the plan for like, for example, um, non guest memory state inside of the hypervisor how to break that exactly yeah so essentially um there's we have a few we have a few other patch series um not even related to to kvm about uh protecting heap and stack memory for example uh, um for say your control plane or whatever you have also running on the guest so it's like kind of like a, a patchwork of different things that take different things out of the direct map yeah so KMAP does still work. It does still work on 64-bit, and we were using it recently because we were trying to protect stuff in the kernel with cache tables. So cache tables and stuff. So it does still work. It's a possibility. We can ask this, but there is a patch out there that you could actually use it. So you may want to take a look. It, it, I, it, there's some awful bit bits, but it might be inspiring. I mean, one pl um, one thing I heard about heard out earlier is that um, about M mapping something that is that is not in the direct map. Um, so the 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 way I've viewed it this so far is that if we adopt this sort of shared private 
in both inside of sketch memory when the private part of it doesn't does not have the diagonal benches because you can't map the private part and then if you want to map it you need to convert it to shared um, then because the when we want to map it then that's when we want to for example because we have a virtual IO buffer that we don't want to bounce because of performance reasons and so we convert the virtual IO buffer to shared in place we do IO on that and because it's shared guest memory we can gap it we can and map it wherever we want. And then once we're done with what IO, then we convert it back to private. Uh, so that's sort of the model that um, we've been thinking about for this. So and, and so the, oh, sorry. One question, so I, I mean, we heard secret mem, we don't want that because we want to gap it. W what, what is the gap user we have in mind? Um, so for example, for, for what we do in Firecrack at the moment, uh, the, the virtual stack, um, we essentially, we get a virtual buffer and that's some point of the guest memory and we just pass it straight to a read or write support, for example. So it would not be possible to replace the gap by a guest memory plus offset lookup. Like there was a discussion about VFIO instead of giving it user space, like addresses, you give it a, a, an FD plus an offset. So like you have a clear entry point where you could just like map it because like, you know, somebody needs it, so I'm gonna K-map it, or I don't know what, add it to the direct map and then have a way to release it again and then you would uh, eventually like uh, like unmap it again from the direct map. Meaning that we don't make gap more complicated than it's supposed to be, but rather like target these users that really need it, like VFO to just consume a file descriptor and an offset. Um, so yeah, so for us, we, we don't support VFO in Firecracker. Yeah. VFIO, this is about normal IO. So your, your VMM implements, I don't know, a VFIO block. It's gonna want to then do read and write syscalls on dev block something or a file or something. This is where the kernel is gonna gap. Or other things, gap is new in the grand scheme of things. There's other paths that won't gap. But uh, this is what we do. Uh, regarding this fine grain stuff and the buffers you've talked about, right? Have you looked at the address space isolation path series that uh, the, my team at Google from Google has posted? Like, is there? I think there's a quite lot of overlap here. Wh when you say transitions between sensitive and non-sensitive addresses and doing flushing and then mapping things back and unmapping stuff, is that pretty much where we're at with the AFI? I, I talked to your colleague about it actually during the break at the microconference. Um, the the main argument for why we don't want to do um, ASI is that. With this sort of direct map um, unmapping approach, we get a sort of principled mitigation that is also applicable for all sorts of future, not yet discovered spec sets execution attacks that are based on this like spectra approach. Whereas for ASI, if you do your um, you you do your tr um, transition from the B privilege to higher privilege yep. um, context, you do a bunch of mitigation. So whenever there's a new vulnerability found, you need to actually apply a patch and add this mitigation to this new vulnerability to your transition code. And we we don't want to do that, essentially. We would prefer a solution where we have this future-looking protection without needing to. So you're patch. actually scrubbing data off the physical memory. Like how is it how how is it, how is it protecting stuff then? Like if you're right now, we are removing the mappings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, w what's different here? Uh, so, uh, sorry for the simple question. But like how do you how do you mitigate any training that the attacker would have done to leak data out of the physical uh, the non-linear map? Um. Well, we remove the memory from the diagram map as soon as it's allocated. So right after we do the gmem grab folio, uh, kvm gmem grab folio, we just remove it from the diagram straight away. And from that point on, um, once it makes it out of the TLBs and whatnot, um, the as, as soon as you try to access it through the spec to let it float, the MMU is just gonna tell you no. Th that, that I agree, right? But when it is mapped, mm -hmm. you will need to undo the training the attacker would have done there, right? You would need to do the IVPB, you would need to do uh, RFC stuffing and all that, all, all those things. When you map it, you will need to do that, in a pr even if it is in a privileged context, because the attacker may have, maybe waiting for you to map it and then leak it out afterwards. By the time we map it, we assume that the memory does not contain sensitive information anymore. Okay, I still need to grapple with this. <laughs> we can talk after if you want. Uh, okay, I think there's a question on the way back. Uh, yeah, so just to clarify, this basically means that uh, the idea is that when the guest, for example, sends uh, I.O., sends send some I.O. request uh, to the host and then the host forwards this I.O. to the disk, and if this ha happens to involve like a get user pages uh, for direct I.O. or something like that, then you assume that the um, contents that, uh, of the I.O. are non-sensitive, right? So like 
things, things that are like stored inside guest memory, like TLS keys and so on are uh, considered sensitive, but things that go over like storage and network like that are not, I guess. For the initial implementation, we're, we're approaching it, it piecewise. So for the initial implementation, we, we don't consider the protective IO problem yet. We're hoping that at some point we will have some sort of IO pass that doesn't include pr introducing this through direct masking. I guess if you use the like KMAP approach, then even after get user pages, the data would still be protected as long as nobody actually like KMAPs it in the kernel to read it. So you could like, uh, like send it off to like hardware devices uh, as long as the kernel doesn't actually want to touch the data. I think in that case, you have to assume that if the guest cares about confidentiality, uh, all the storage is encrypted and all the communication over the network is TLS. You, you, yeah, but it's the same. Like uh, 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 another guest exploiting something or the host uh, doing it directly. If all the if all the IO is uh, if all the IO has to be encrypted. Case, uh, even if we use something like a KMAP approach, for example, or convert the, the various buffers to remap them, because we know those buffers only contain IO data, which the guest has secured in a different way, then attacks to that buffer don't matter. Uh, so the both approaches will work. The, I'm sure the KMAP ID will make a lot of brain explode, so <laughs> what you're doing is probably a, a quicker path to uh, <laughs> do something. So anyway, I mean, um, to me, it's five of all, I, I wasn't actually going to focus on the entire I.O. problem um, for, for this talk. Um, well, well, I was mostly, well, the problem I was mostly looking to discuss was um, how, to, how to deal with KVM internally wanting to access it. So, for example, the scenario on x86, the way MMO emulation works is that um, KVM receives a page file from the guest, but then it only receives the guest virtual address, so it needs to do a page table walk, and then it needs to do an instruction fetch. Um, or the way KVM clock works at some point, the, the guest tells us where's the KVM clock page and then we, we need to be able to access it. Uh, how do we deal with these sort of accesses if the guest is loaded inside of guest MFD and we don't have direct map entries? And my assumption so far was that we would also not have user space mappings that would be reflected back into the, um, back into, um, the mem slots. Um, and the, the, the problem that when I was prototyping all of this, which I run into is that um, if we have sort of these like sort of like for example instruction fetch it's a very short thing you convert it to, to shared you do your instruction fetch you convert it back to private you can put a lock around it it's sort of atomic um, you nothing too much can go wrong but what for example to do with things where things have to be shared for longer term the way for example at the moment KVM clock the, the KVM clock page works is the guest writes to an MSR it tells us where is this page um, and then it tells us to PCA we currently I, I see David wanting to say something. <laughs> um, where's, the, where's the little cube? Ah, oh, there. Of course, the GFN, the PFN cache literally already does use KMAP implementations. Uh, yes. <laughs> There's two, because the, the, the KVM clock is sort of a, not a complete one-off, but it's longer term, but I think it's already built. Uh, KVM clock uses uh, GPC, uh, yeah. But the long-term ones, I think, are less, that specific one is less concerning because it's just okay to, if we had to, it's a one-off per, like, per vCPU. So your exposure there, if we had to do something ugly, isn't as bad as if we had to. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the bigger problem is the emulated MMIO and instruction emulation in general where I agree. You don't want you would have to you would have to mmap everything to practically be able to make forward progress. So I agree that we would yeah. have to because the guests can't know about in, in advance which emulation uh, which instruction is going to cause the MML fault. Right. So for those though, if it's just the short term, well bounded thing, we can page faults are off the table because there's a guest MFD and we can go directly to it, or we can pre fault those at the time though to grab the MFD. So can we just deal with it by saying you're not preemptively in this section while you're doing this short access? Mm. Like, do we need to make it more complicated than that? Or is that essentially what you said? Um, 
I kind of just lock the folio. I do the conversion. I access it and convert it back, and I unlock it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the, yeah. So the, have the you run into any problems with this? I guess is then the question of. I have something that works. <laughs> if it's acceptable, is the other question. <laughs> Um, and I guess the the, uh, the other one with the, the page table walk, because the page, the page table walk is kind of like an in-between thing between these two, because first you walk the page tables, and then later you set the access bits on the PTEs. And the way it currently works is just like, um, there's a, it like takes the, it takes the user space pointer, it caches it somewhere, um, and then later it updates the access bit. So you also have this like this, this sort of like longish term, or medium term thingy, where I wasn't sure if it's okay, okay, can I just like keep the, the page table folios locked this entire time or but that's where I was talking about the preemption thing when mm. we're doing those accesses that's under a s that's under a reader writer lock taken for write so ignoring real time kernels you are in a non preemptive as section so it it's slower than actually it's probably not even slower than the emulation path like the mm. emulation path you're going to have some slow accesses too so i don't think it's that big of a concern in fact no, because yeah, well, I did. My hesitation is more just having this special case, mm -hmm. more ways to access guest memory, but I'm not going down that path to deal with it. Mm. Yeah, I mean the one. Yeah, the one. The one that's giving me giving me a headache was was the KVM clock one because the KVM clock. Uh, the the PFM type it responds to MMU notify events, so now it needs to respond to the equivalent from GMEM. But instead of only just marking it as invalid, we need to potentially do the conversion back to private. Uh, for example, if we just have a memory attribute chain, um, then the memory is still there and it could be reused by something else later. I mean, if we're doing um, if we're doing a file okay, we don't have to care because it's going to be allocated away anyway. Um, but that's where it actually got like really ugly because. Be able to just mark it as invalid, at least as far as the if DPC just, is concerned. If right. you just mark it invalid, um, that works in the sense that we're not going to get any crashes or anything. Um, but from a security point of view, if you just mark it invalid, then it's going to stay in the shared space um, indefinitely. And if it gets marked invalid because we do a memory attribute change, um, which why you would want to mix these things, I don't know. But um, <laughs> If you mark the GPC <laughs> invalid, mm -hmm. if you're not the access anymore, why leave it shared? Why leave it the page shared? That's up to you. Um, well, because I can't just do direct map manipulation in the MMU notifier, can I? This shouldn't be MMU notifier. This should be a guest mem SV that we're fixing. If we're backdooring in the guest mem SV, this isn't going through core mm. MM. Can I, could I theoretically do some snap map sleep inside of these yes. GMEM things? Okay, I can just do that. Well you that just need, uh, because you can actually sleep in most MMU notifiers. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, well, actually, th the big invalidations have a flag that says block or not. Mm -hmm. um, and right, right. The, only one, the only one that says no, you can't block is the um killer. Everything else you can block, but that doesn't work. Oh, interesting, okay. Yeah, but whenever you have this operation which, which will want to take it away from the kernel again. Uh -huh. You can go and mark all the PFN to PMM caches as invalid, and, and any access to those will be holding a read-write attached cache. So you take the write lock and you mark it invalid, and now you do not have to worry about any read write again. Yeah. So if we convert KVM from PU to PPC, then That's that job is done, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, um, y you could even convert everything to use a temporary one, but I'm gonna run away now. I converted <laughs> the page table box to use DPCs if you look at my patch. <laughs> Um, so this uh, mentions x86 quite a bit. Are you also interested in this for ARM64 or only x86? Yeah, very interested in it for ARM64. And thanks for reminding me about it because I okay. wanted to talk to some people in the audience about that. After okay, yeah, because because yeah. um, well, we can talk after this. But mm -hmm. the unmapping things from the direct map is quite a lot more difficult on ARM64. The there's some horrible trade-offs there, so we can we can talk about that separately. Yeah, I know already that on ARM we don't have to worry about DNA error emulation, for example, because the CPU right. just decodes it for you. Yeah. Whereas in x86, we have to dis dismap it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, th I think we're at time. Um. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>